morning, church. It's so good to be here today. I am so happy to be able to be sharing the word of the Lord with you today. So if you're on the other side, let us know where you're watching from and who's with you. We'd love to know all those details. And please do share them with us. Um, today I want to continue with the series that I started called Snapshots. This is part three of Snapshots. Now before I get into a few more details, I want to just quickly do something with you. I want you to pick a number. A number between 0 and 101. Write that number down on your paper. You're going to need it a little later in the message. Okay. Got the number? You wrote it down? Okay. So today, we're going to be talking in snapshots, we're talking about a quiver. And a quiver is a container for arrows, and I have some arrows here, they're not real arrows, but they represent arrows. So a quiver is a container that keeps arrows together for a warrior, for, for a soldier, or for if you're a hunter and you have arrows, you're going to keep them in a quiver. And every arrow is designed specifically to take its target out, to, to deal with the enemy. They're powerful, they're piercing, and they have a purpose. Now in Psalm 127 verse 5, their arrows are likened to children. Children born to a young man are like arrows in a warrior's hands. How joyful is the man whose quiver is full of them. He will not be put to shame when he confronts his accusers at the city gates. Now we're not going to talk about quiver full today. There, there are many well-known families who follow what we call the quiverful movement, and they have many, many children, they're very large families, and, and your reaction to that might be telling of what you feel about it, but we're, we're not going there today. The idea is that we want to talk specifically about how we are like arrows, how we are like arrows in God's hand, and, and also we want to go to a scripture today in 2 Kings chapter 13, so you can open your Bibles there and keep a finger in or a marker in 2 Kings 13 for later as well. In Isaiah 49 verse 2, Isaiah is likened unto a sharp arrow in the quiver of the Lord. And that is, that is something that I want us to think about, that we are sharp arrows designed and intended for specific targets. And we are set for a specific time when God will and is going to use us. Now in Hebrew, in Hebrew language, the word for arrows or quiver and arrows is the arrow is the term, the Hebrew term there is the son of the quiver. Son or sons of the quiver. And so we are arrows in the Lord's arsenal in his quiver, waiting to be shot from his bow. And I don't believe that God wastes arrows. He doesn't just shoot them with no purpose, in no direction. God always has a purpose and intention for the arrows that he shoots. Now, in the series, just to backtrack a little bit, you, if you were with us, or, or you can go back and look. The first we looked at um, Jesus going into the temple and seeing there were there were people selling animals for sacrifice there were people changing money in the temple and Jesus looked at this and I don't know if we can say that Jesus got upset but Jesus began to get himself ready to make a point about what the temple was for and he said my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. Now, I brought a whip today, and because I don't have everybody, anyone else in here, I'm going to dare to give it a crack. Okay? So Jesus went and he drove away those, the tables, um, turned over the tables and drove the, the people away using a whip. That is an intimidating sound. Something that we liken for the use of training circus animals or something like that. But Jesus used it 
to make a point, clear out my temple. It is for one purpose. It is to be a house of prayer for the nations. And in that series, or in that lesson, we look at how our prayers are not meant to be transactional. What do I mean by that? I mean that we don't come to God in our prayers and begin to make a deal. In our lives, we don't try to make deals with, with our behavior and actions with God. What do I mean? God, I did this thing for you. You owe me, so do this one thing. I prayed, I fasted, so God, you have to deliver. No, I believe that, that what God wants us to know is that, that though there are conditions of obedience, but we don't obey for the king. Right? Oh, perhaps sometimes we do. But the point is that we don't obey for the blessings so that we can get whatever we can out of God. We obey because we love God and we are loved by him. We don't obey out of fear of punishment either, but we, we obey because we value God above everything. And that is why. And then we went to the next lesson. We looked at the shofar. Now, unfortunately, I can't, I can't get a sound out of this that sounds good or, or worthwhile having a sound at all. But I have something here. The sound of the shofar, distinct sound that needs to be made to declare that there's a battle, that there is war going to happen, or that the festival has begun. But the important thing is that the sound be very, very clear. Because if it's not a distinct sound that is made, then those who hear that sound will not know exactly what to do. And so it is important for us that we understand that there be a very clear sound, that we are that clear sound for the Lord as well. You see, we have received God's forgiveness, and so we need to live as forgiven people. Now today back, we are, we're going to look at arrows and the quiver. Now we become aware of the fact that Satan uses arrows, right? Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16, talks about the fiery darts, or, or different translations will say, talk about the arrows, and Satan shoots these fiery arrows at you and me. He shoots it at God's people, shoots it at believers, and now you can get you can get to the point where well, oh no, fiery darts are coming away. Do not be afraid. There is no need to be afraid unless you are unguarded. And the same, the same chapter, Ephesians chapter 6, tells us how we can be guarded. With the shield of faith, we can be protected against the fiery darts that the enemy will shoot, shoot at us. The shield of faith. But remember also that when we look at the, the um, armor of God, that's preceded by a command and instruction and imperative that we put on the armor. If you don't put the armor on, if you don't follow in obedience to the word of the Lord, then the armor does you no good. To keep it in your cupboard when you are on the battlefield, that is a useless place for it. Put it on and then go to battle. Now God has arrows as well, and God uses these arrows in a much better way. You and I are his arrows, and we're shot into a hostile world to bring it to subjection in Christ. You are an arrow of the Lord. Now another thought comes to mind when I think of, of an arrow and being shot is, is the idea of sin. Now sin means to miss the mark. Now that's a curious thought, to miss the mark. Um, so, the imagery is an arrow being released from the bow to its target. And it's done with perfect aim. And a true arrow, not a, 
wonky one, twisted and bent. The arrow needs to be perfectly straight. And when this type of arrow is released from the bow, it and released with with a good marksman, it hits its target. It hits where it's intended. Romans chapter 3, verse 23, we know all have sinned, right? That is, their distorted behavior is proof of a lost fall. They are formless, much like the earth was when Paul, when the Spirit of the Lord moved across the waters and God spoke. There, there is a formlessness that, that exists in, in those who do not obey the word of the Lord. Now, the word, the word sin is in the Greek the word hamartia, and it is, it is the negative form of maros, which means that it is without form or identity, and that means to fall short. To be inferior, to miss the mark. Now, what is the mark? What is the mark that we are intended to, to hit? And that is the glory of God. That is the mark that we are meant to hit. And then when we when we occupy ourselves with sin, we will always miss the mark. Now in Romans chapter 14, verse 23 tells us. For whatever is not of faith is sin. And Hebrews 11, 6 says, And it is impossible to please God without faith. Faith is the necessary ingredient for us to be able to hit the mark in life. Because without faith, we're going to fall into sin. You see, now, now don't get mixed up with, with faith as just having, just having a mental constraint. Um, assent to something just to say, well, yes, I, I, I think I believe that, or I say I believe it. Faith without obedience is not faith at all. Faith without obedience will lead you to stumble and fall. You cannot just say, I believe in God, and then live as we please. If we say we believe in God, then our life is going to show, it's going to demonstrate that there is belief in God. Because sin is an act of rebellion against the law of God. And God's laws are not obscure, they're not hidden from anyone. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 1, you can go and read it, that God's law, God's purpose, God's plan, what God expects has been made clearly known to everyone in the things that he has made. Isaiah chapter 49 verse 2 says, he has made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he has hidden me and made me a select, other translations use the word sharp, select arrow in his quiver, he has hidden me. So God is making you and he's making of me select arrows. He, he has a purpose for us. He is, he's in, has an intention for our lives. And it is for us to understand, to get in line with the purpose of God for our lives. We are not just here to live out our lives, our days, and that be the end of things. And for the believer, well, the end of earth and the beginning of, of eternal or, or heavenly life. No, God, God actually intended for us to, to have a purpose in this life that is greater than just marking time. Have you discovered that purpose? Have, have you realized that you are that select arrow, that you are that chosen arrow, that you have an intended purpose, that you have a target that God is, is aiming you at, and he wants you to reach that? Think about that, consider that, and begin to ask God, God, show me, show me how you would use me today. Because there's so much that God wants to release through his people, and not for another time. Don't, don't think that God wants to do it in you tomorrow. I believe that God is saying today. Today he wants to speak a word into your life. Today he wants to make you aware of the purpose of your life. And you don't have to wait for tomorrow. For, for those who, who are, are kids or, or teenagers in school, you might say, well, well, my purpose will become more clear when, 
or when I go to college, or when I'm done with college and I start work, or, or when, I, when I marry, or when I have children, or later on. You see, what happens in our lives, we always postpone our purpose. I don't believe God wants to postpone our purpose any longer. He has selected us for his purpose, and he wants to reveal that and make it known to you and to me in this day and in this time. You are a select arrow, sharp in his quiver, and we can't wait to shoot you from his bow. Now, arrow that's in the quiver remains close to the Lord. The quiver is a dark, hidden place. Um, I list the some types of quiver, and it's a place that, that, that is slung over the shoulder of, of the, the warrior or the hunter who keeps his arrows, and, and it's kept close to him. God wants to keep you close to him. Don't, don't be the arrow that's left at home. Don't be the arrow that doesn't want to stay. Be the arrow that's, that's hidden in that place. That when, when the target arrives, God will find you in his quiver, and you will be already purpose arrow for all that he's ready to do with your life. See, the words that you speak carry anointing. Yes? Your words are powerful. You don't think so because you, you don't consider yourself as, as someone sent by God into the place that you go day by day. But you are sent there with a word from God to speak into every situation, to speak into every life you're not just in a place there to be still and be quiet. Those who will silence us are not of God. Because God has sent us with a word to speak. So remember, you don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to be a apostle or prophet to be anointed. You just have to be a child of God. And you have to be filled with the Spirit of God. Have his anointing. He has rested his hand on you. You are anointed if you're a child of God. Receive that anointing, walk in it, and begin to speak words of deliverance wherever you go. Speak them over your family. Mm -hmm. Something's not the way you think it should be. Begin to speak the word of the Lord over your family. Speak deliverance. Of course, don't just speak deliverance and then act out like you're still in bondage. Amen? Right? So it's important that we know that our words are there. As I said before, arrows need to be true. They need to be perfectly made. They can't have warps in them. They can't have twists in them. They can't have a bow in them. An arrow has to be straight and true to be able to successfully reach its target. When it is not, it fails. And so as, as we allow God to form his character and his nature in us, we become true just like Jesus Christ. Now, we have an intended purpose. We have a prime target that we are intended to hit. And it is his anointing that destroys the yoke. Zechariah 9.14 refers to God's arrows of deliverance for his people. The words that God gives us to release are to bring deliverance and transformation for those who will receive them. The Lord will appear above his people. His arrows will fly like lightning. The sovereign Lord will sound the ram's horn and attack like a whirlwind. Wow. God has a purpose to drive out the enemy from all the places where he has no right, where he has no authority, you know what? When you think about it, he has no right and he has no authority over your life. He has no authority or right over your family unless you give it to him. It's time that we begin to sound the ram's horn. We begin to sound the shofar. We begin to declare that this is a day of victory over our families, over our situation, over our circumstances. God has come to give us victory. 
Now, I know that when we think of victory, we think, well, well everything's suddenly going to pan out well and work out perfectly. No, we are, we are warriors, and we are constantly there to push through and press in until we see the victory, and then we begin to enforce that victory every place that we go. See, you are to be a polished arrow, just like Isaiah. And you're supposed to radiate his glory. See, we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but, but that's where we miss the mark. But hitting the mark means that we radiate his glory, that we match that glory, that we connect with all that Jesus has accomplished for us, that we know him as Lord, that we know him as Christ, that we know him as God in our lives. 1 John 3, 8 says that, that but when people keep on sinning, it shows that they belong to the devil. So you've got to break that cycle of sin. Believers have to break that cycle of sin. We cannot just live with the idea that, that well, I'll just, I'll just keep trying, I'll just keep, I'll just keep this. I believe that, that keeping on sinning is very telling here, and we have to be set free from that cycle in our lives because those who are born of God do not sin. See, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning, but it says here, but the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. He came to destroy the works of the devil. The question I have for you, did he accomplish that? Did he succeed? You say yes. I say yes. He did indeed succeed. He delivered a powerful, impactful victory that we can walk in, that we can live in. He did. But every place where you see that the enemy acts as if he has ground, he has authority, and he's at work, is a place where we have to enforce that victory. It begins right here at home. He shall not have victory over because Jesus Christ came to destroy the works of the devil, and he came to destroy those works of evil. Amen? Now this, this is the passage we're talking about, 2 Kings chapter 13. This is a great passage of scripture. I love this account of Elisha's life. And it's just a, a very small account. It's, it's interesting. See, the this is the passage that actually speaks of the death of Elisha the great prophet. See, between the time before this, when we hear of Elisha, and this actual time of Elisha, 43 years pass. And in those 43 years, there is no word from the prophet. There is no, there are, there's no miracle. There's nothing spoken. It's, it's 43 years of silence, of quiet. God is not speaking. And Israel, the nation of Israel, is just plundering one king after the other, after the other in this time, doing as they please, continuing as if there was no God. They had no direction, they had no word, and when the silence is finally broken, this plays so Elisha was suffering, <coughs> the Bible says, of, of the illness that took his life, his final illness. He was struggling on this. And it's hard for me to think. I've, I've thought about this, and I'll just share with you. Elisha, the great prophet, that healed the sick, raised the dead, and himself is coming to the end of his life. It's just something that I think about. Somehow you think of someone that, that was so powerfully used that God would just live forever, right? No, not so. But that's a distraction. Excuse me. So the silence is broken, and Elisha is suffering from this illness. He's on his deathbed, and there is this king of Israel who suddenly realized, wait a minute, Elisha, as a prophet of God, was key to Israel's military success in the time. 
And it's the life, so he understands that without God, there could be no hope of victory. So he goes to find the problem. And Elisha gives this king one last opportunity to be blessed in building and saving the kingdom of Israel. He tells the king that he should get a bow and he should get arrows and he should hold them in his hand. And actually, the king got himself three arrows and he had a bow. And that was an easy thing for the king to have because he had some soldiers with him. And then the prophet took his hand and put his hand on the king's hand. And what he's doing is he's making a very clear thing that what is about to happen next is a prophetic enactment of what God will do in Israel. Think about that. It was a clear prophetic enactment. The prophet laid his hand on the king's hand and began to give him some clear instructions. Second Kings chapter 13 verse 14 to 20. Would you read that with me? When Elisha was in his last illness, King Jehoash of Israel visited him and wept over him. My father, my father, I see chariots and charioteers of Israel, he cried. See, King Joash was the ruler after his father. But the Bible says he did evil in the Lord's sight. He refused to turn from the sins that Jeroboam, his grandfather, the son of Nabat, had led Israel to commit. He had an opportunity to make right what generations had made wrong, but he refused. What, what in the past was broken, what severed the relationship with God, this new king refused to take care of. See, there's, there's one thing we can look back and we can say, well, well my grandfather did this, or my great-grandfather did this, or my parents have done this. That's why I'm like this. I'm telling you today that it's time that we stop refusing to break yes. the pattern that was set before us. Now, if you have a godly heritage, then don't break that pattern. Build on it. But if one thing is that so often we use past generations, past experiences, past things as excuses. This king refused to break what needed to be broken in Israel. And it put Israel in a terrible problem and situation. But here there is a brand new opportunity presenting itself. Oh, thank God for the new opportunity. Great brand new opportunities. Verse 15, Elisha told him, get a bow and some arrows, and the king did as he was told. Elisha told him, put your hand on the bow, and Elisha laid his own hands on the king's hands. Elisha was showing the king a prophetic demonstration, an enactment. He wants him to understand that his actions from now on will prophesy events that will follow. This prophetic enactment will speak victory over the future. And this action of the prophet putting his hands on the king's hands was exactly that. It was understood in Israel what it means to put your hands on someone. To, to by an anointed one or the priest to put his hands on. It was understood what the laying of hands meant. And this was clearly an act to show and demonstrate that God was about to say something and do something through these actions. Maybe think about praise. Sometimes we, we're called to praise God and nothing's going on. In fact, everything is going down with we don't like what we see, we don't, we don't like what we experience. It, things are just bad. But I believe that praise is a prophetic enactment. 
When we praise God when things aren't going right, we are, we're declaring prophetically that God is God above all. And that my feelings or my experience of what's happening around me is not what limits my praise. No, no, my praise is toward God. Think of your praise as a prophetic enactment. You're raising of your hands, you're clapping of your hands, and if you if you can, you're dancing before the Lord. Think of those things as prophetic enactments to the praise of his Lord, to the declaration of the victory. If you had a great victory in your life, if you if you had something wonderful happen that that say you 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 were delivered from from a great debt, or you were you were set free and, and healed of, of an awful illness or a terrible pain, or your child who was who was in in a difficult situation in their life because of sickness or or conditions that they were born with or picked up through life, and then they were suddenly healed and delivered of those. What would your reaction be? Would you react enthusiastically? Or would you react, well, oh, it's, it's so good that that happened. You know, it's no big deal. I'm just so happy today that this great weight has been lifted off me. I don't know many people that would react that way or respond that way when um, something great happens. Now, when I was in Florida, I was watching just a little bit. Not that I enjoy the show that much, but but the price is right. Anybody know the price is right? Now there they win prizes. And they win money in cars and all kinds of things for guessing the correct price of something or close to it. And I could see how enthusiastic those people are on that show about winning a few dollars. Now sometimes they win a lot, but, but the point I'm trying to make is that they were enthusiastic. I mean, they jump about. They they come dressed all silly and crazy. These people come there to be on TV, and they make absolute fools of themselves for the simple privilege of winning some prize. But those who are about to receive great the great blessings of God, who have received the great blessings of God, well, we are just not very excited. Come on, let's turn our praise up, right? As a spiritual, as, a, as an enactment, a prophetic enactment of what God has said he would do in our life. I think if we do that, we may change a whole lot more going on. Now that's a little off target again. I, I, I kind of missing the target a few times today, but I did. there's so many points that I want to share you. Okay, let's go to verse 17. Then he commanded, open the eastern window. And so he opened it, and then he said, shoot. So the king shot an arrow. And Elisha proclaimed, this is the Lord's arrow, an arrow of victory over Aram, for you will completely conquer the Arameans and Africa. Oh, wow. The king had not had any victory. If you read the preceding verses in that chapter, you see that, that, that the army had been so depleted by the constant warfare and attack, they were in a desperate, hopeless situation. And the prophet says, victory, specific victory. You will have victory in a specific place over a specific people. But Israel's enemies were more than this enemy. So, yes, the king could have rejoiced over this, but, you see, he would have complete victory in one battle. That's what was promised him. But remember, the prophet had shown him, set him up, had primed him to understand that now there are prophetic words being spoken, prophetic enactments. Verse 18, 
Then he said to them, Now pick up the other arrows and strike them on the ground. This next act was to reflect the role that the king would play in God's plan for his people. We can see that God has done amazing things for us. Through Jesus Christ on the cross, massive deliverance was acquired for us on behalf of us because of Jesus. God continues to do amazing acts of deliverance in our lives. And I believe that they are there to speak of what is to come. Can you mark a time when God has done something amazing in your life? Amazing act of protection, a, a, a point of deliverance, a place of healing, where God has worked in your life. Can you mark a situation like that? Can you remember when God has done it? Keep that in mind, because now it is our time to act. It is our time to respond. God has put his hand on us. He has laid his hand on us. He's put his prophetic hand on us and said, now it is time for you to act. To show in a prophetic enactment the victory that you desire. Now it was meant here to be symbolic of King Joash's, of Israel's willingness to take up the task at hand to join with what God was willing and wanting to do through him. So the king picked up the arrows and he struck the ground. Once, twice, three times, and then he stopped. Now three is a good number, right? Three is a good number. But think about it. When you pick your numbers, between one or zero and 101, what was your number? Ah, 101. Anyone else pick a, the top number you could? I know that you wish you would have. Because you thought, well, it's just any number. No, no. Pick the maximum you can. And this is what this king should have done. He should have picked a great big number. In fact, he should have hit the ground. He should have used the arrows as this prophetic enactment until he, he ran out of physical strength. That's what he should have done. See, three is a good number, but even David picked five stones, even though he only needed one. He took more than he needed. But let's see what the prophet says here. Verse 19, but the man of God was angry with him. You should have struck the ground five or six times, he exclaimed. Then you would have beaten Aaron until he was entirely destroyed. Now you will be victorious only three times. Wow, only three times. Now three victories is good. But what about when you get to your fourth battle? See, God doesn't just want to give us line up, well, you have, you have a few victories ahead of you. God wants to, to give us victory after victory after victory. But in this case, it was dependent on the enthusiasm of this king for the victory. He did not seem that enthusiastic. He was in a hopeless situation. He could not, with his army, all with these people, he could not win over the enemy. He needed God's help. But he was not desperate enough, so it seems, to enact the victory. First of all, he, he didn't break away from the keeping of idols that his father and grandfather kept in Israel. But also when it came to, the, to enacting the victory that was ahead of him, he did not put all that he could into it. I believe that God wants to speak to us and tell us that, that as believers, we have got to put all that we can into the things of God. 
to be able to have victory in our life. We have to put all our energy in. I believe the days of, of half-hearted effort or just, you know, we have this excuse where we say, well, well, you know, God understands that I gave my best. The question I have for, for myself when I use those words is, did I really give it all that I could? Did I, did I give it to the point where, where I knew I was out of strength? I had no more to give it. Because I believe that is the mark where we decide, where we know we've done enough. Have we given it all? Or did we just surrender? Or did we just say, well, that seemed enough? You see, sometimes, sometimes our best is not our all. And God wants us to have all. Not just what we consider our best. King Joash was given an opportunity to bless him, a chance to join with, with what God was willing to do in his day and time. Everything was in place. God had declared victory over the enemy. The king believed in what God could do. And that's why he went to Elisha in the first place. He was aligned with God's will in terms of establishing the kingdom of Israel, or victory for the kingdom of Israel over its enemies. Things were in line there, but he failed to follow through because he was not enthusiastic for the battle. So where did it all break down? It broke down in a number of issues. We picked three. I hope you picked more than three today. In the number that you picked, the number reflected what he was willing to do. In Jesus, our Lord, so much more than delivered in his victory over sin, over hell, over Satan, over sickness. And when we read of his exploits and victory, what are our thoughts? Let's not strike the ground only three times, but let's strike it. Let's continue. Let's press through with great diligence even perhaps to the point of exhaustion, saying, I will see the great victory of the Lord in my life. Let's use everything we have, not like King Joash. You see, verse 20 is a very sad verse. Verse 20 is a verse that, that makes me really rethink a few things. It stands all by itself. And then Elisha died and was buried. No more opportunity. No more. He couldn't go to the prophet and say, Come on, give me another chance this time. The prophet died and he was buried. No more opportunity. We must understand that the will of, that we will run out of God opportunities in our lives. I know some people this will never happen. God is not a vending machine of endless opportunities just because we want another. There are not an infinite number of opportunities for all to have. You've got to grab the one that is in front of you and give it everything you've got. You cannot say, well, tomorrow another one will come. Today, the opportunity is there. The moment that God speaks, the opportunity Opportunity is there. Grab a hold of it enthusiastically. Put all of yourself in it. I've got to put all of myself into it. I've got to pour myself out for it because right now, God wants to use me as a targeted arrow, as a word into a situation to bring deliverance. But I cannot just sort of say, well, there will be another opportunity. We do run out of opportunity. run out. God is presenting us with an opportunity to do something significant in our world, in our time. He wants to release the supernatural power 
into the earth through you and through me. And what is happening is eternity is colliding with time. The Bible calls this kairos moments, and, and in Bible exploration, you heard of a kairos moment in the life of Abraham. When God waited, and it seemed like God waited to the point where, where nothing was humanly possible. Everything had run out except God's word to Abraham. And then heaven collided with, with earth and heaven's timing, a kairos moment, and Isaac was conceived, and the promise was on its way. And then Isaac was born. Kairos moment, an opportunity. Abraham had his own ideas. You heard about them. Sarah had her own ideas. You know about them. But God's plan, that's the one that can grab a hold of that. And that baby. You see, eternity is colliding with our time. These Kairos moments. Now, the Bible has two words for time, Greek language, Kairos and Kronos. Now, Kronos is where we where we look at our calendars or where we now have on our watches or our phones, we mark time, seconds, minutes, hours, days, months. But kairos, there isn't really even an English word for it. That's why we use the Greek word. And it's a quality of time. It's a moment pregnant with eternal significance and possibility. God has put such a moment. He has made that statement over your life. You are a can I say, you are a pregnant arrow just waiting to be released for what God has intended your life to be. You see, the sense here is that time, not just marking time, minutes, seconds, but, but now time is touched by God and there is a there's a prophetic opportunity. There's an opportunity for purpose, for divine purpose that has happened. You see, Jesus spoke to the city of Jerusalem, and the Bible says he wept over Jerusalem. He said, how long have I tried to gather you as a hen gathers the chicks, but you would not. Their opportunity ran out. Their opportunity was still running out. But we're not going to be the people who are going to say, well, we missed an opportunity. We may have missed some before, but we are not going to miss any more. There's no point in crying over the spilt milk of the past. Because if there is, by any chance, another opportunity that life offers us, we're going to take it. Amen. That needs to be our commitment today. That when, when heaven touches earth, and there's a God opportunity, a pregnant moment, so to speak, that we will take a hold of it and we will see what God wants to do. See, Joash missed his Kairos moment. But I am not willing to miss mine. I am not willing to miss mine. God wants to use you, and before he does, he will prepare you so that you can hit the mark. You no longer will miss the mark. You will no longer just live in a cycle of regret and, and disappointment. I believe that God is releasing people to a place and to a point where you will know your purpose. You will, you will sense the divine hand of God on your life and you will begin to walk in that. receive that today. Because you can. Yes, you can. Yes, even you can. You can hit that mark of God's purpose for your life. Psalm 18, 34, and I close with this verse, says that he trains my hands for battle. He strengthens my arm to draw a bronze 
is it's God who trains us for battle. It's God who prepares us for his intended purpose. Let him, let God prepare you today. Let him work in you. You are so much more than you could ever imagine before that you could be in the hands of God. Oh, so much more. So much more. He is the marksman. And he is going to shoot you through his bow. And you will hit the exact target if you allow it. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word today. I pray, oh God, that as we, as we contemplate this message, as we understand, Lord, that there are opportunities that you have set before us. Lord, that we take them, that we grab a hold of them, that we enthusiastically carry them out, Lord, that we give it all that we can, that we put all that we have into it so that we will enact, we will enforce, we will display the full victory of our God in the earth today. Lord, help us. I pray, oh God, that even right now, you would help us to see, help us to hear, help us to understand. Lord, this time in which we live in, a powerful, prophetic moment has dawned upon your people. Lord, it's for this time that we are to put your own hand. Lord, I pray that not a single one hearing this message today, Lord, not a single one hearing this message, Lord, would be as King Joash, just being so unenthusiastic about the things of God. Lord, but that we would, that we would.